Hello everybody, it's Dr. Rick dropping in on you. I hope that everybody is having a great start to your weekend. I hope that you had a great week, but remember, no matter how it went, if you're still breathing, you're still in the fight, and there's great opportunities that lie before you. All right, you've probably heard this story before. You've read it in my bio. Uh, you read it in some some, some write-up about me or you heard me talk about it in an interview. But uh, I was born to a 15-year-old uh, mother. Uh, God rest her soul. We just laid her to rest. Uh, man, uh, just laid her to rest. So uh, that's still hitting. Uh, my father was an absent father. I never met my father. And when I say I never met him, it means I never met my father. The first time I saw my father uh, was at his wake in a casket. Uh, and when they put him in the ground the next day and that casket descended into the ground, every hope or dream I ever had of having a relationship with my father went into ground with that. And so... I experienced all kinds of emotions and struggles and things of that nature, but fortunately I had my great grandparents who reared me uh, because my mom obviously wasn't prepared to be a mom at the time. And they adopted and reared me. So I got a lot of love. I've got, I had a strong man in the house. C.D. Wallace is who I strive to be each and every day as the representation of a man, not in his persona, but in his performance. And every day I wake up striving to be the man that he was, the man he taught me uh, to be, and I'm a work in progress. But um, I had a journalism teacher who happened to be the wife of one of my football coaches, and she knew my story and she and he spent a lot of time with me to bridge the age gap that was that between me and my great grandparents you got to think my great grandfather was born in 1909 my great grandmother 1917 so that's his great gap and just the parenting then was different than the parenting was in the 1980s when I was a teenager and going to high school. And so she would pick me up, spend time with me, uh, coach them. They would take me places that my grandparents simply wouldn't even think to take me. Um, and so she got to know me. And so my junior year, she told me to do research on absentee fatherhood and what the impact of it is. And so and this is funny because it's right around the time I discovered Dr. Francis Chris Welsing. Um, and she set me on a path of uh, the science of psychology. And here I am. So uh, it's, it's interesting that all these things happen. I don't believe in coincidences. I don't believe in uh, happenstances. And uh, I believe everything happens for a reason. And it comes from something that's a cause and effect always in play. And I thank God for the people in my life who inspired me. So... I did the research and I wrote the article. The article was called The Invisible Father. And it was supposed to be just for the school paper, but knowing this, if you know Miss uh, uh, Myra Nell Williams, uh, Leonard, she married Coach Leonard. Most, most of the younger cats know as Myra Nell's Leonard. I knew her before she actually married my coach, after she married my coach. So, uh, but anyway, if you know her, she's the extra mile person. She's actually teaching because she loves teaching. And she chose our school because she wanted to impact black students. And I thank God for her. She was so inspirational. But anyway, she took it, got it published in a bunch of local publications, and got it published nationally. And so the, that was a buzz around the article for a while. And I always said, you know, man, I love writing, which I did. I loved writing. Uh, and she knew that. And I said I was going to write the book. But, you know, you graduate, you go into other things, you start to experience some success. And, you know, life is kind of flowing for you or whatever. And so I didn't write it in my 20s, but in my 30s, uh, I had a revelation. I had some things happen and I felt, OK, it's time to sit down and write this because the revelation was that all of the success I had experienced in my 20s, all the things that I was doing and striving for was trying to prove to a dead man, my biological father, 
that I was worth his love. That's the impact of absentee father. That's the impact. Even though I had a powerful man in the home, I had a number of coaches in multiple sports uh, that were pouring into me for more than just coaching me. Teachers in every almost every classroom that were pouring into me. That one person who never saw me and I never saw him was eating at me. And so I started to write my first book, which was The Invisible Father. Go figure. Uh, but it, the subtitle was Reversing the Curse of a Fatherless Generation. Um, and here we are 20 something years later. Um, and I'm on my, we just released my 27th book, which is the fine, I mean, follow it, finally the follow up to my first book, The Invisible Father. This one is uh, The Invisible Father Legacy. And the reason I finally said, okay, it's time, I always knew I would because it was so much that I could not bring out in the first book um, that time experience and uh, an opportunity presents itself. And I think that right now, uh, never has it been more evident that we need our men in the home. We need our men in our children's lives. And, and I understand there are a lot of different things that can impact us. And I this, this book is a challenge to men. It's not a condemnation. It's a challenge. Um, it's a calling to the court. It's a calling to the mat. It's like, hey, it's time to stand up. It's time to square up. It's time to do things. And I and, and, and as a person who's had to battle and take some some L's when it came to came to a couple of my kids uh, of trying to fight because they became pawns and weapons. Uh, I I understand that. And so the the thing is, isn't to sit up and and and. and condemn but it's also not here to lay out an excuse we can't have an excuse we don't have the the latitude of having an excuse and so it's the clarion starts with me and I'm a firm believer you don't stop parenting when your children become of an adult age uh, you're going to always have a space to parent them because you're going to always have a high level of knowledge, experience, wisdom. And so there it is. And so my challenge is that we do this, but I am, am really truly excited about this new book. We released it on the 17th of October. Uh, I haven't really pushed it a lot. Again, I've been dealing with the death of my mom. So my focus has been on loving on my family and doing the things I need to do uh, myself to get through this. Um, and it's been challenging, you know, uh, because so many other things preceded it that I've just kind of been pushing through some things. And this one was like a slug. And, and I don't think that it is again, coincidence that my mom died in the same month that my dad died. Um, and the holidays have just been I mean, ruthless to me since I lost my great grandfather on Thanksgiving of 1992. Uh, my divorce was October of last year. Uh, I buried my brother two weeks later last year. Um, it's just so many different things that have happened. Uh, and I've never really truly been really excited about hitting uh, the holiday season because of it. Um, and then it became better when I got married because Marion was real big on holiday, you know, and so it was fun, had family and everything. So it's been kind of crazy, but, um, what I can tell you is I thank God. I thank God for the friends who reached out. I thank God for, uh, the, the listeners, the viewers, the people who follow me, who have gone out of their way to reach out. People who I didn't know had my address or my phone number were texting me and emailing me. And the love is appreciated. 
Uh, my family and I have got a long way to go. Like I said, this is real fresh. Uh, this is real fresh. We are basically two weeks out from, you know, burying my mom uh, and having to do with that. So, again, this is the optimal time for me to talk about this because I'm feeling all of the emotions. They're raw. And fortunately enough, I have an avenue through which I can express my passions uh, through speech, through lectures, through uh, my writings, uh, my books, my articles, my papers. Uh, so I have that and I can breathe and, and exhale from that. And what I want to do is I want this book to be a clarion to the men, uh, a revelation to the women, an inspiration to the youth. Uh, and so it's written um, with an intertwine of faith science, sociology, psychology, and pure encouragement. And I think that uh, this is gonna be one of my be best uh, books. I've done some things I'm excited about what my books have done, but this one I think is really going to hit home. Uh, for those of you who want to order the book, the link is gonna be in the description box underneath um, the links to show how you can support the work we do. Uh, one, one real quick thing, uh, I have partnered with Wellspring uh, Family and Community Institute, the Harris County Sheriff's Office, uh, Pastor Deckard uh, at Greenlight uh, Community Church in the Greens Point area. And if you're from Houston, you know the Greens Point area. Uh, we are doing a symposium on trauma and community relationships with police and it's going to be entitled Healing the Hood. I'm the lecturer, I'm the presenter, but we're also gonna have a panel discussion with some of Houston's most powerful community influencers, people who are actually boot on, boots on the ground. And it's going to happen on the 18th of this month. It's going to be live streamed. So even if you're not in Houston, it'll be great if you can check it out. Uh, if you're in Houston, we're inviting you to come over. It's gonna be at the Green Light location, uh, which is off of Greens Road, right off of 45. Uh, Green Light Church, past E.A. Decker. Um, but the beautiful thing about this is we sit down and we came to a consensus that this isn't a one-off event. This is a second event I've done, including Wellspring and Harris County Sheriff's Office, dealing with epigenetics, dealing with trauma, uh, dealing with the influences of the microaggressions and the continued envir uh, environmental stresses uh, that are impacting the long-term health of blacks. I did the first one in March of this year. Uh, this is the follow-up, but we're also going to be following up with resource um, uh, resource access, meaning that this isn't just an event. This is our way of introducing ourselves into the community in a way that it hasn't been done and then delivering. And so I'm excited about it because it's what I've been pushing for. Uh, some things are finally opening up. There's still a lot more to go. There's still a lot of resourcing to do, but we are trusting and believing and we are pushing. And so I'm excited about that as well. So again, um, it's time to put in work. It's time to change. And I'm real big about going into new years already focused and moving in the direction that I want to be headed in. So I'm challenging you guys. Let's do some things differently as we close out this year. On that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here and get in this gym. I got to put in some work, take care of me. Uh, on that note, uh, love on yourselves. Love the people around you. Appreciate the things around you. Stop constantly looking for what's wrong. Start to appreciate the things that's what's right, that, that are right in your life. Start to look for the things that are worthy of your gratitude and learn how to be grateful. That is what I'm going to leave you with today. And I will talk to you probably a little later, hopefully. On that note, I'm out.